Hey guys, Zompfox here, and today we're going to be doing a different kind of video. Since the USFL doesn't start for another few months, I decided that we're going to take a quick, brief history of each USFL team. And for the first episode of that 8-part series, we're going to be talking about the Pittsburgh Maulers. The Pittsburgh Maulers came into the league in the 1984 expansion where they added six separate teams. The owner was Edward J. DeBartolo Sr., whose son owned the San Francisco 49ers, and he himself owned the Pittsburgh Penguins. It was kind of a questionable decision for the USFL to allow him in, as he was basically viewed as an NFL owner since he was very tight with his son, but the league decided to put him in for the fact that it would give the league instant credibility. Another thing is that him and his business partner, former Steeler Paul Martha, already had a deed to be able to play in Three Rivers Stadium, and since they already had the lease to play there, it was pretty much a really easy done deal for them to join. Now, they immediately tried to do things that made sense. They wanted to try and get Dan Marino to join them since he was from Pitt, but, you know, didn't work out. The team instead was able to build a team around the former third string quarterback of the Dallas Cowboys, Glenn Carano. And to support him, the team had drafted with the first overall pick, Mike Rozier a Heisman Trophy winner that was projected to be a top three pick in the NFL, they got out of nowhere. And they were also able to get Greg Anderson to join the team as he would be one of their, or he would end up being their solid receiver. The team itself ended up not doing too hot that first year, safe to say. Their head coach was Joe Pendry, and he only played 10 games. He was supposed to make a quarterback change that the team wanted, but he was refusing to do so. And because of that, they ended up just firing him and then ha hired their interim coach, Ellis Rainsberger, who ended up going 1-7. and seven. It's important to know that even though the team ended up going a pretty pathetic 3-15, and 15, that most teams they played were really good, either when they played them or ended up being playoff teams. So even though it may seem like it was terrible, it's not really that bad because nine of those games were against playoff teams. And as I already mentioned, a lot of them were against hot players. So it kind of makes sense why the team did what they did. So aside from that, the best player of that team that year was Jerry Holmes as he was selected to the 1984 USFL All-League team. Their single-season leaders were Glenn Carano in passing yards with 2,368. Receiving yards is Greg Anderson with 994. And running and rushing was Mike Rozier. They finished tied for third in the Atlantic Division, going 3-15. and And, of course, they missed the playoffs. The team heading into 1985, which if you don't know is when they moved to fall, basically decided to pull the plug right then and there. They attracted 22,000 fans a game, or more like 23,000, but even though that seems like a pretty respectable number, it was actually 13th out of the 18 teams in the league, so it's not like they were one of the most popular teams in the league. They weren't like the Jacksonville Bulls, Tampa Bay Bandits, Generals, Stallions, or Gold, who all got over 33,000 fans, so even though they had respectable fans and even sold out their first game of the season it really ended up not being that much. And with the vote for the fall schedule, the fact that A, the owner's son already had an NFL team, and B, the owner knew that there was no way they'd be able to compete with the Pittsburgh Steelers, as April was a good time. The reason it was a good time where the Penguins were still really bad at that time as they had just drafted Mario Lemieux. And of course, the Pittsburgh drug trials of the Pittsburgh Pirates is going on, so they were basically viewed as a team that could be the best team in April. But moving to fall, having to complete with the Steelers, even though they w were falling off some down years after the 70s, it still was a terrible move. And so, even though he had just hired Hank Bolo to be their head coach for the 85 season, he decided to pull the plug and fold the team. And of all the one-season wonders of the USFL, the Pittsburgh Maulers are the only team that straight up folded after one year. They didn't connect and go to another city. They didn't merge with any other team. They literally were there for one year and then disappeared. In terms of players that go on to do anything, they're, the guy that led them in receiving, Greg Anderson, would have one more solid year in the USFL, and that was pretty much the end of his career. And then 
Mike Rozier, that famous first overall pick, he would go on to be a two-time Pro Bowler in the NFL for the Houston Oilers. He'd play one year with the Jacksonville Bulls in, before the league folded and went to the Oilers and Falcons, which he'd play the rest of his like very short career in. Overall, he didn't really do too much in the league, both in the NFL and USFL, except give the league credibility. As for Don Maggs, who was one of their offensive linemen, he'd go on to play in the NFL for another like for another nine years. He had a decent career. Jerry Holmes, the only member to have any sort of accolade for the team, would go on to play a another like six years in the league, playing for the Jets, Lions, and Packers. He was solid. He had a bunch of interceptions a couple of years. He was decent. Um Glenn Carano, their quarterback that they got, would end his career after playing for the Maulers that one year, which, oof. And Mickey Sutton, a cornerback that they also had that was also pretty solid, he would go on to play another five years in the NFL as well. And of all the players, probably the most overall successful player was actually Les Brown, who was another defensive back. The, the Maulers did nail having three cornerbacks or defensive backs that would go on to have at least some pro success, which is fair. But Les Brown, um, he's actually in the Canadian Football Hall of Fame, believe it or not. The Pittsburgh Maulers are the first team played for, and after he played there one year, went to the Hamilton Tiger Cats for four years, the Blue Bombers for two years, the Ottawa Rough Riders for a year, and then two years of the BC Lions. He was a CFL All-Star six times, a CFL East All-Star five times, and a CFL West All-Star once. And in 2006, he was voted as one of the top 50 players of the league in the modern era. And he eventually became an assistant coach for the Blue Bombers. That's honestly pretty surprising that their best player would go on to be a Hall of Famer just in the Canadian Football Hall of Fame. And honestly... As you can see by a lot of those players, I mentioned a lot of players that basically just played in the NFL. Some of these other teams in the USFL had guys who went on to be the Hall of Famer, whether they were in the front office or players, and some of them had guys that would go on to be solid in the NFL, but the Pittsburgh Maulers have a pretty bad distinction of basically just being bad. They had very, very few players that would do actually anything of note. I mean, they had Mike Rozier, who was a two-time Pro Bowler, but aside from him, no one really was a huge impact player in the NFL. And with their best player being Les Brown, it's pretty surprising. The Pittsburgh Maulers are going to be back in the 2022 season. Hopefully this time they'll outlast their original counterpart, which means they just need to last two years. If you guys have any requests for the next team to do comment down below which of the other seven teams you want me to cover if you want to subscribe and hit the bell you'll be notified immediately whenever i upload a new video this has been zom fox signing out have a great day